There are some problems here. For example, when is language more determinant? That is, when we can be relatively sure of what is meant. When is it more indeterminate and open to interpretation and diverse uh, points of view and renditions? We must accept that not all language is equally indeterminate, I think. That terminology exists, grammatical rules exist. If we give you something to translate, you will tend to agree on some areas and disagree on others. So indeterminacy is not the same uh, across what we do. It's possible that the more complex the text or the speech, the more indeterminate it is. However, when you look at complex texts, literary texts, you find that there are key points. There are always networks of meaning, and if you make a decision, for example, when you're translating and you make a, a decision at a key point, at a node in the networks, that will tell you how the rest has to be translated. A classical example is uh, the Brecht play Le Gute Mensch von Sensuan, um, which I, some German person will now translate for me. No? German people? <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's a play about a Chinese woman who dresses up as a man in order to assume a position of power and to, 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 to act. And um, how you translate that term mensch, which refers to the woman who dresses as a man, is very key for, because that term, bench, appears in the play, but also it sets up what the audience is going to expect and how this cross-dressing position of taking the power um, is going to be received. It's also the title of the play, it's got to attract people to the theatre. Uh, so it's rather tricky. It's one of these key notes. And if you decide there, then a lot, a lot of other things are decided. They go to bench. Any? It's hard. It's hard, thank you. That's, yeah. What are the available alternatives? The good person. The good person, very good. The good human. The good human, I like that. The good man. The good man, it could be, because mensch would be, you, normally you would put man. Yeah? But if we know there's this gender thing, then the good person. The more there are of these nodes, the more complex, and the more decisions have to be made, the more indeterminate the text, and that seems to make some sense. But, uh, it's not just a matter of having, you know, if you've got a mathematical proof, it can be long, it can have many elements in it. That will be a complicated text, but not a complex text. Because complexity applies to making of choices and notes. Okay? An airplane has lots of bits and pieces put together. Okay? It's complicated. But an airplane is not complex, you hope. You hope there are not many places in that airplane where they've decided between two or three things and they have to keep deciding. Okay? You wouldn't want to fly in that sort of plane. Uh, so some texts can be complicated, but you can translate them. A legal contract can be very complicated, but it's not complex. You break it up into its parts and, and read the parts one by one, and, and you know, with a dictionary or a glossary, you're fine. But a pressure play, or a philosophical text, or a speaker who's, who's this is real world, as you might know, somebody who's using very bad English, a conference, and you're trying to pick up what's going on there. You know, that, that is complex. Complexity is what relates to indeterminism, not complications. How do we live with it? I suggest I suggest that indeterminacy is what happens in our language, that we should be aware of it. You know, think of the important things in your life. Do people really understand you, do you think? 
you know, if somebody tells you they love you, what do they really mean? When you say you love them, what, what does that mean? I mean, you should worry about this, I think, for at least one night. <laughs> okay. After that, you're going to have to accept that language is a very poor instrument of communication. We're all communicating very poorly. Uh, how can you live with it? Okay, worry for one night, okay? And then you get to the point that you don't understand yourself, and then you get really worried. But you come through. <coughs> Faith, belief, just say, I believe that that person loves me, God loves me. I believe that my professional work is great. I believe I'm good. Bad, whatever. Pure, pure belief. Faith is, is, is one way of solving all that problem. You know? Nothing against it. It's living with indeterminacy. Some people handle it by retreating into worlds of norms and regulations. People who work in localization love drawing up a flowchart and a rule for everything and a procedure and you must do this, this, and then check this, and be checked by that. Oh. So all the complexity becomes complication and there is no indeterminacy. Okay? The localization projects, project management, is a constant denial of indeterminacy. <laughs> in other cases, we do find that when translating a text and you get to these highly indeterminate passages where you really don't know what's going on, and it's important, um, very often translators will solve it by closing their eyes and being as literal as possible. Stay close to the source text. You know, if I really don't know what it means, I'll just... One of my favorite examples, I, we used the term last week, or on Tuesday was it, of, of the virgins, and the virgins love you. Yeah? And the, the term virgin appears uh, later in, uh, well, in Isaiah, in the doctrine of the virgin birth, that the mother of Jesus Christ was virgin, miraculous, <coughs> as you might have heard. Everybody is Christian. Um, um, uh, a translation of the Bible performed in, in Spain um, in the 15th century um, by a Jewish rabbi who was paid a lot of money to translate the Hebrew text into, into Spanish. And he came across this and he had the term Allah in Hebrew and he didn't want to translate that as virgin because for him Allah was a young girl. A maiden, as you said, but he didn't want to support the doctrine of virgin birth. Uh, his clients insisted that he put virgin, virgin, uh, because that's what they knew Jerome had put in, in the Latin, and they had a debate. And you can see it in the text of the parchment. It's been whatever was there before. We don't know. It's been scrubbed out, and he's written Alma, Alma, in Hebrew, young girl, maiden. Alma in Spanish, Sol. Okay, just pure literalism, even though you know, it's, not, it's certainly not right, but it looks like it could be right. <laughs> and, and translators quite often do that. You know, if in great doubt, just go with the source text, blame it on the source text, blame it. You know. How else do we live with indeterminacy? Well, trial and error. We try one thing, we see how it goes. It doesn't work, we try something else, see how that goes. Until we get to something that uh, minimalizes the negative effects. Doesn't do harm. And another way is to create context. That is, if it's not clear, what we're translating is not clear, there are many possible ways of doing it, we can tell people about the possible ways. I usually, at this point, I've given this lecture too many times to remember, uh, but I usually try to pick up some indeterminate phrases that are circulating in the news media. And this week, this is one that's circulating. Uh, we're in the week where uh, the representatives of Palestine are seeking statehood at the United Nations, and the representatives of Israel are giving a thousand one reasons why that shouldn't happen. And the main recurring reason is that we need an Israel that can be defended. Therefore, the 1967 borders are obviously inoperative. Okay, and everybody's accepted. 
What does that mean? I mean, I can translate that, you can translate that literally into as many languages as you like, word for word. Okay, we can do it. But are we working on the meaning of it? You know, defend it. I, 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 we have a verb for defend, to defend. That's okay. We can do it. But what does it mean to defend a border when you have nuclear weapons and the people across the road don't even have an army? You see what I mean? What are you going to defend a border for? Anyway, okay? Now I've upset some of you, but no. Other phrase circulating this week is don't ask, don't tell. Uh, which was the US Army's policy until this week for uh, gays and, and lesbians in the Army. Okay, you can do whatever you like, just don't tell us about it, we won't ask. And we're becoming aware this week, if you look at the news, that you know, what seemed to be a, a good, benign doctrine of acceptance and tolerance was anything but, has been anything but, has been a, a repressed, hidden, a sneaky witch hunt uh, with people uh, living their lives in perpetual fear. We can translate the words. But are we ever really translating what has been the meaning and the sense of phrases like this? When they're acted out in the situation in which they have value or force. I want to suggest here, because my, my concern with these talks is on the spoken versus the written. And I, I've come to this in two minutes. The sophists, the people working in Greek before Socrates, were working on rhetoric, uh, used this term kairos for the ideal moment or the critical moment. That when you're speaking, uh, you choose the point where something should be said and it will have an effect and be understood. Okay? And that notion, kairos just means time, weather even in a contemporary reading. But it's really the critical moment in rhetoric. I, I like to use it to describe understanding. Often you don't understand what's going on around you. you know, when you're a little kid and watching your parents talk. Whatever. And then there comes this moment. You didn't understand that that person really loved you. And then there's this moment of truth. Where you didn't understand that you had some truth to say and you've been repressing it for your whole life. And you say it and suddenly you're crying and you don't know why you're crying. But this thing has been built up. There's this critical moment when understanding does work, when peoples come together in, in, in some kind of real sense and meaning which is communal and very powerful and beyond words. I suspect that does happen, but it happens in spoken communication. It happens in the situation. It happens when people are face to face. Kairos is why people come to talks instead of reading a written text. Kairos is why a talk should not be people reading for a written text. Because the poor interpreters can't handle that. If you're interpreting, that is, if you're using spoken medium, you can use Kairos. You can edit things out. You can omit. You can add. Because what you're looking for is that moment of understanding that is in the ideal mode. And not uniformly throughout the text. However, written communication builds in that setting, builds in the context, builds around the, the key utterance to give it a situation that can travel. It's like as if I wrote a description of this talk here, describing you, describing me, describing them, and picked that up and transported it through time and across continents. In that case, if translators really want to communicate some kind of profound sense or meaning beyond the words, I suggest that what they should do is elaborate more setting. That is, add the prefaces, add the glossaries, add the notes, give all the written assistance that the end receivers will need in order to attain some kind of momentary kairos. That's my practical suggestion for how to deal with